get to turn it up right before. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have a few things to get through. We have, um, there's a couple casting announcements, although one isn't quite official yet. Mm -hmm. And um, we also have, we watched a little bit more of Epic for this one. So what should we start with? PG, like the Percy Jackson news or the, um, the Epic stuff? Um, let's do the Percy Jackson like show stuff first. Yeah. So the biggest one is we have a new Zeus. Mm -hmm. um, and it, his name's Courtney Vance, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he very much seems like, I don't know, he gives similar vibes to Lance Reddick. I'm trying to be like cautious about how I say this because it's not like he looks the same, you know, but there's there's something about the way he holds himself that feels similar. He's very much the same sort of actor. Like Lance Reddick was somebody who was just kind of known where like he wasn't known for like one specific role. Mm -hmm. he was known as like this really good actor that was in a lot of different things and always had this big presence. And Courtney Courtney Vance is the person we're talking about. And he he's married to Angela Bassett. Like I saw people calling him Mr. Bass Mr. Angela Bassett today, which I, <laughs> I love that. But yeah. Like when I saw him, I was like, I know you from so many things because I just recognize you from so many different stuff that I looked it up and he's been, he's won like, like five Tony awards. He's won like four Emmys, like every award possible he's won. And so that's kind of like the presence I feel like they're going for with Zeus. And I just always very much appreciate this show being this like tiny little microcosm that exists where like you don't have to worry that a show that gives you diversity is suddenly going to take it away the like moment that they could yeah because um, there is a char a character no there is a, a content creator on here um justin or like freddie's roommate is his his thing and for like the last i don't even know how many months since the show aired basically in the beginning of the year he mm -hmm. has been getting crap from people being like thalia won't be black and or Lance Reddick died, so they're going to recast somebody else who's not black as Zeus. And and like I tagged him and or I wrote in his one of his videos today, like you should go look and see who they casted as Zeus again. Mm -hmm. And he like liked my comment and then made a video a little bit later. And I did that because I'm like, I want you to be happy. Yes. Like, I want I don't I want people, especially right now, who are black, to be able to look at a show and be happy that they continue to get that no matter what they could have easily given it to somebody else but they're right. obviously like no we want this sort of actor to be zeus and that's it the end like the end yeah just <laughs> deal and that <laughs> i'm laughing because that's continuing on with the other casting thing that isn't like officially official but it basically is because the person the actress acknowledged it leah like Po reposted the post about about her on like her instagram story but i forget her last name right now her first name yeah, is her first name is sage i remember that much and she's another actress that she's 23 and she's mm -hmm. canadian she is a really good dancer and things like that but from her instagram but they casted her as somebody and they haven't said like who it is Mm -hmm. But they did say that it's a recurring role. And so my best guess was Allison, pretty much, because that's the age that the Allison character was supposed to be. It was like somewhere between the ages of like 18 to like 20 or something was the casting call for it, at least, that mm -hmm. that one news source posted. And so that fits. Yeah. <laughs> Allison, I know some people initially were saying that she would be Cersei, but that doesn't make sense because Cersei's only in one episode. Yeah. And um, and Becky Riordan like literally just said no <laughs> to somebody on Threads, and I was like, thank you for immediately stopping that before it got to a ridiculous place. Um, because no, it doesn't make sense for her to be for her to be Cersei. She could be like somebody else, like selena or something like that but i don't want selena to be that old yeah the like whole story is about her being groomed horrifically by luke and so i want her to stay like younger to like make the point of who luke really is 
And so I'm going with the fact, at least at this point, that she is like the actress Sage like posted um, a picture that was very obviously in her trailer on set <laughs> to, today after they posted that that article about her. And there really is no reason for like the random like kind of media whatever website that posted about this like they wouldn't know about the character Allison or whatever but um there's no real reason for why they haven't said who she is or even acknowledged her at all at this point yeah. um, besides the fact that she's playing like that new character that whoever she is will be very interesting because she's a new character yeah so it'll be interesting. I mean, I'm sure they're going to have to announce it soon now that the cat's out of the bag. Um, so we'll probably see what character she's supposed to be, I'm guessing, in the coming week. Um, yeah. I know yeah. I said, I, we talked about this last week where we were talking about like, oh, when do you think they're going to put out like a full length trailer? And I said like somewhere near the holidays and I could see them putting like things like this out, like that they recasted Zeus and that okay. this um girl is on the show they also said that somebody an, like an older woman is also has like a small part in the show and just looking at her stuff she looks like a somebody who does like stunts a lot mm -hmm. of the time so that's probably what she is too but i'm assuming that things like that are like being put out there because they're probably going to put out a longer trailer sometime soon that gives some of that stuff away and yeah. so telling us about it now so that everyone everyone's gonna like freak out when they see it anyway <laughs> in a good way <laughs> in the trailer but it will be like more fun if we know a little bit beforehand so we're not like totally shocked that Zeus is even in this season like I don't even know like what is Zeus gonna do in this season yeah he's, he's not in the sea of monsters book at all <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's curious that they recasted like now instead of, you know, season three, because he is in season three, or he will be like canonically, we know for sure. But yeah, there's no Zeus appearance. It's not like they've shied away from showing the gods like out of order. But yeah, it's, it's still interesting. They decided to recast him this soon, which means we are going to get some Zeus scenes, or at least one. The thing I thought about that I was like, oh, that would be really interesting is if they, when they were doing flashback things, if, oh, yeah. they, if they not only showed like Zeus's reaction um, to, you know, what happens to Thalia, but also any interactions between him and Thalia at all. Mm -hmm. Because because the books are from Percy's perspective, we don't really get those very much at all. And so it would be really interesting if they use the flashback stuff to show like how she feels about him. Um, Cause it just sets up like her kind of explosiveness, I guess, into like the world that she does in Titan's Curse that you don't really know how she feels about everything. Um, that was like the only thing I could think of. They could do anything though, because I mean, this show added in like Hephaestus and way more Poseidon in season one and um, and Hermes when he, when nobody expected them to be in that book either. Yeah. And so it's possible they'll have something else happen, but I at least hope that they have something about him just like mentioning Thalia or even just how he feels about her at all. Yeah, flashback scenes, I didn't even think of that, but that would make the most sense. Um, I mean, I don't know when demigods are given magical items by their parents, if it's always like directly given or if it's sometimes like given by proxy. So I'm sure there could be a scene of him giving her um, her Aegis, maybe, yeah. I don't know, something like that. Or it could be just the saving her scene, somehow like actually showing him acting in that scene. Yeah, and I, I feel like they usually get things like that from their parents when they get to camp mm -hmm. and they're claimed in some way when they're at camp, even if they don't actually like really meet them. Like Annabeth has her hat from her mom. I don't actually know if Athena and her actually met when she was little and got to camp or if it's just that item got to her while she was there. Um, so like, obviously 
Thalia never gets to camp. She okay. dies like right in front of it. And so it's like an interesting just thought about like, did they interact at all in any way during those years when she was out with Luke and Annabeth on her own? Um, Cause that's interesting to think about. <laughs> Yeah, like even if it's just interacting and she doesn't know it's Zeus, I could see that being a possibility. It makes me think of Lost and like um, Jacob, how he just kind of randomly appeared in people's lives. I could see the gods doing stuff like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I could definitely see them doing things like that. And Zeus is such a jerk that he would show up and be like, you're doing this wrong. <laughs> and she'd be like, why are you yelling at me, random homeless person? Or whoever she thinks they are. I know Apollo shows up as homeless people for whatever reason in these books, but I don't know if Zeus would like degrade himself enough to, to look like a homeless person. He would see that as a bad thing. Yeah, no, he'd be like businessman probably. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we have that news. And also, you've been following some fan drama this week that I think we should talk about. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So since we do this Percy Jackson podcast, one of the things we like to talk about about it is trying to protect the child actors on the show just mm -hmm. from everything that can happen to child actors, including their own fan bases and so sometimes i see videos from teenagers and i'm like what are you guys doing <laughs> this this week was one of those times and so i feel like this necessary need to like defend dior again um who plays clarice on the show because people in general have been unfair to her about things for about a year and about certain things about her for like a year and like things with her have come up in a way that's such a social media thing and i feel like this story is just a good example of why like for lack of a better word shit posting on the internet isn't just you being a like an like an asshole it actually can like have weird effects <laughs> in ways that maybe you don't think about when you don't care like i know that's something that teenagers do a lot they just don't think that the things they do will like make a difference or like matter or whatever to people. But <laughs> I guess the first thing I always wanted to defend Dior about is one thing that people say about her is that she's a Zionist. And the reason why people say that is because when October 7th happened last year, when the propaganda about that was like absolutely like the levels of absurdity about that was like off the charts, like there were people Israel was saying that they beheaded babies mm -hmm. like anyone who heard that story that they beheaded babies and like were like our wording like women on the street before they found before they admitted months later that all of that was a lie like at that time the first couple weeks of October especially it was like super intense when it comes to that stuff and so at some point during that she posted on her Instagram story something like supporting Israel she okay very obviously because she was 17 <laughs> did not like actually grasp the like full idea of what was going on and since then doesn't post things like that at all and um and beyond that like i guess the thing i have noticed since everything with palestine became like this weird trend <laughs> and like on social media the way like Palestine is obviously extremely important, but there is a part of it that has become this weird trend sort of virtue signaling thing outside of like what is actually happening there. And so somebody who posts propaganda put out by Israel when nobody, when if you looked at that, you wouldn't realize yet that it wasn't real is not a Zionist. Mm -hmm. As a Zionist is somebody who believes that Israel has a right to exist to the point that Palestinians do not, that Palestinians do not deserve to live, that they don't deserve to be on that land, that Israel has a right to destroy and kill them all. That is what an actual Zionist is. Somebody posting something on their Instagram story because they don't know any better yet does not mean that you have adopted the Zionist propaganda machine and think that every Palestinian on earth deserves to be killed. Yeah. And so calling Dior a Zionist feels very 
it feels like you're saying that about her because you just want to find something wrong about her that you can be like, oh, I don't like her because I'm jealous that she's friends with all of these actors that I have crushes on. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to call her a Zionist because that gives me an excuse to be a bitch to her. Yeah. Because the other part of this story is that somebody who had like an account that I guess was like, she doesn't like Leah or something, like an anti-Leah sort of account, Mm -hmm. she very obviously baited Dior where she used her song in a post and then she posted the first picture was like Dior and Tamara who plays um Thalia and you know Dior liked the post like no big deal and then later on she like the other pictures in it were like against Leah in some way but anyone like scrolling on your on like your FYP especially if you're somebody like Dior who has like fans who use your songs, you're just gonna see somebody posting a picture of you and your friend and you're gonna like the video and keep going. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna realize or look at the account and that account kept changing like the caption under the video. Like when she liked the the video, it was fine. And then later on went back and changed the caption to being something mean about Leah. And so then she was like, look, Dior doesn't like Leah. (laughs) And, and like, kept changing the caption as, like, the day went on when people were obviously being, like, what the hell is your problem? Like, why do you have, like, an entire account against, like, Leah, who plays Annabeth? That's really weird. And then she tried to be, like, oh, no, I actually don't like Dior. And I was trying to set her, and I was trying to show that she's a bad person by doing this. And I'm, like, you baited her. You literally baited her. You you baited her by using her song and posting a nice picture of her and her friend so that maybe she would like your post. So then you could try to make it look like she's a bad person later because you're a teenager and you're probably bored and you're trying to cause like chaos for whatever reason, which it did. Because then after that happened, then I start seeing posts of people saying that like people are mad at like Walker and Tamara because they didn't defend Leah. And I'm like, this is like the parasocialness that we talk about with these actors a lot you don't know who they are based on what they do on social media you have no idea who you are they could hate each other and you will never ever ever know like they could literally despise each other i don't think any of them do but they could and you would never know you know why because they're actors It's literally their job to act. They can act like they like somebody that they don't. You will never be able to figure it out by like micromanaging the things that they do on the internet. You can't bait them into posts to prove that they don't like an actress that you don't want to like or that you don't want to like them. It will never, ever work. And it's just the ridiculousness of they made this post about Dior to try to do whatever they were doing there. And then all of a sudden it became into this other big thing where people are like thinking that these other actors on the show are like not good people because they haven't defended Leah over something that didn't even happen. Like people are upset about something that did not happen. Mm -hmm. Like she liked a post that she saw from somebody she thought was a fan of hers. And so you're like, people are getting all riled up thinking that Dior is a bad person or that Walker and Tamara are bad people because they haven't like stood up for Leah and stuff. And it's like, even if they did do that, that stuff would never happen on social media because mm-hmm. social media isn't real. <laughs> this stuff is not real. You have a parasocial relationship with these actors. You don't actually know who they are. And yeah. no matter what you do and like hyper fixate on these things, you will never know that about them unless you somehow in your life become friends with them, but you probably won't because you are so much of a fan of them that you're making up literal fan fiction stories about their friendship and who you think is friends and who is not based on if they like a post or not on social media. It's so stupid. And we've seen like how this actually happens. Well, you don't find out that castmates didn't like each other until like, at least a decade after the show is over and <laughs> they'll randomly either come up in an interview or maybe like a tell-all book um and it's it's also like a thing of like is it really worth it to bring this stuff up and have people's opinions 
like to look at these the other actors on the show differently based on things that you think is happening it's one of those things of you can never like fully disprove it because they're never ever ever going to acknowledge something like that like it would be like ridiculous and honestly truly if one of them acknowledged this girl's post people would then start saying that they shouldn't acknowledge it because they have a much bigger platform than her Mm -hmm. and so like no matter what they did there would be no way of them being able to get out of that situation without people being upset with them about something and so it's better and safer for them to say nothing and generally honestly Dior probably has no idea that this has even happened and probably doesn't even care. And if she does know, it's like she probably doesn't even know what they're even talking about. Like she was out to eat with her friends, the friends that all of you are saying aren't her real friends, and was just like liking posts when she was posting her own TikToks and somebody like made it into a whole big mess. Like, I guess you can spend your time like making literally like making up personalities for these different actors but i feel like you're almost like ruining the fun when you do that kind of stuff Mm -hmm. because it's like you're like reading into things so much that it's you're like letting yourself change the opinion you have on them based on things that never actually happened (laughs) Yeah, and like, let's say you actually successfully stir up drama among the castmates. These people have to work together. Mm-hmm. Like, they're going to be stuck working together at least for another few months, hopefully for another few years if we get a bunch of seasons. Like, why why mess that up? You know, Clarice is a reoccurring character, not just in this season, although she does have a more diminished role in, like, Titan's Purse, as we saw in our recent reread. But, like, mm-hmm. she pops up in a lot of the books still yeah and it's also a thing of because of how the internet is if somebody says something on the internet even if it's not true and it's been like proven to not be true people will bring it up like forever like you cannot stop people from like spreading rumors even if it's been debunked a million times there's nothing you can actually do to control that and considering that these kids are young like Dior just turned 18 a couple months ago, like this past summer. Um, they're very young, like being like trying to do this as a career. And mm-hmm. the things that people think about you, like your reputation and things like that, does affect how many jobs you get in Hollywood or or music or whatever she wants to do, or any of the other cast for that matter, want to do going forward. And if there's all these weird rumors about them on the internet about them like backstabbing their co like their co-stars and things like that that will if it if it's around long enough it like becomes like a a big problem it be, it can actually like affect it can actually like affect things mm-hmm. um, and so it's like i don't know it's it's just like that stuff does have an effect on people if you talk about it enough. Like, I can't think of a good example right now, but there's just so many people, like actors or musicians or whatever, that have had rumors about them that aren't true, that just like circulate forever. And it's like, I don't want a teenager on the internet to start a rumor about someone because they're bored that still affects them when they're like 25. Yeah. <laughs> And, it, and how it goes that's just how the internet is it could and so like what if you stop this now <laughs> maybe maybe yeah yeah um with all that dior does because she does like as you said music she does acting and she's a big part in this season so this could be a very big opportunity for her she's not gonna mess it up over something stupid realistically she was probably going through her mentions and was like, oh, look, here's a mention. I'm gonna go see, it looks vaguely positive. Didn't scroll through the rest of the post. and was like, yeah, like, okay, move on. And probably was doing that to a bunch of people's posts. Shit like this is gonna make her not wanna interact with fans on social media anymore though. Yeah, that's always the point that I make because we talk about like the weird stuff that happens with Walker so far of like his like personal phone number being leaked and doxxed and his at people showing up at his house and his like hometown and things like that. But mm-hmm. so like he's barely on the internet at all. He's basically not. 
in any way. He only does it when he contractually has to, essentially. Um, or if he's just like every once in a while, he'll post something from like a friend or one of his siblings where he's just letting like the internet see a teeny tiny bit of who he actually is because they have done so much to make that an impossible experience. Like, do you want that to be like that with everybody else? Because right now, like Dior likes to post TikToks and, and post videos to like share, like when they announced that Thalia or Tamara was cast, Dior immediately post a bunch of like photos and videos of them. Like when she was like to her first day on set, when they were all really excited about her being there. And mm -hmm. she's the one that posts most of the videos and pictures of the other cast members that people end up seeing when they're filming. And it's like, if you start micromanaging all of her friendships with these people that she's actually friends with in her real life, like she actually knows these people and they're actually good friends with her and everything. She's not going to post that stuff publicly anymore. She's going to post it where they, wherever they post up privately, where no, where the rest of us can't see it. And that would suck to like miss out on seeing their personalities little bits at a time when they're not having to like act like, you know, Disney role models <laughs> and yeah. like those moments. And, but at some point, if this stuff keeps happening, that's just what every person on this cast is going to do because they're going to have to. Mm -hmm. And I would like them not to have to do that because they should be able to post. The thing that's so ridiculous about this is all of this happened because Dior just posted a, a couple pictures of her hanging out with like Tamara and Charlie mm -hmm. and another actress that another Canadian actress that they're friends with. Um, that's literally all that all of this happened because she posted something on her Instagram of her hanging out with her friends. Yeah, and this it was clearly like, like the ones that are over 18, so they were probably doing something where they couldn't have the younger castmates there. Yeah, yeah. and I, I do want to point out the girl that they're hanging out with, I googled her because, of course, I know none of these like Gen Z actors, and um, people are fan casting her as Rachel Elizabeth there, um, so that'd be interesting to see if she eventually ends up on the show. <laughs> she she could end up on the show with somebody because she's canadian mm -hmm. but i also think it is so funny about like i don't even know what to call this i think it is so funny that people saw them hanging out with a girl with like blonde hair or not blonde hair with red hair and they're mm -hmm. like oh maybe she's gonna be like rachel dare one day nobody in this cast looks like their characters from the books that's true absolutely no one like she is hanging out with Charlie, who is playing Luke, who is half half Asian, half white. She mm -hmm. is hanging out with Dior, who is half Persian, half black, and she's playing Clarice. Nobody, nobody on the show looks like the characters in the books. Mm -hmm. Rachel probably won't have red hair. And I also would be surprised if she was white. Mm -hmm. And so like, can we actually get away from that thought process none of the characters on this thing are going to look like anything like they did in the books yeah none of them absolutely none of them we need to like leave that behind if anything it makes it easier when you're reading the books to like separate those two things of like mm -hmm. the book version versus the tv show version like i know the actors have said that it's helpful because they can't like pick, it's weird, I would imagine, like picturing their friends in mm -hmm. their head when they're reading like the books and, and picturing the characters. And so they can picture the book versions com that's separate from in their head from them <laughs> and like their friends <laughs> that they talk to on a daily basis. <laughs> and so either way, like I thought that was just fascinating. I was like, nobody who's in this group of people, like. Tamara is there as Thalia, who is British and black. <laughs> like, it's well to have her accent. Thalia is neither of those things in the book. And like, people are still like, oh, she's going to be Rachel because she has red hair. It's like, no, yeah. no, she's not. And also like, they also just have friends. Mm -hmm. They just have friends that are actors because child actors all know each other. Because what else are, who else are you going to be friends with? Yeah, who else gets it? Like that. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we've long held the stance too, because, um, the other thing about the, like her posting a lot was we were speculating on whether or not they were drinking because in Canada, the drinking age is 19 and, um, at least Charlie and, um, why did I forget her name? Um, Tamara are 19. And so uh, it is a possibility, but like they're Disney kids. So of course, nothing's obvious. And um, they're young. This is what young people do. Like, yep. and they should have room to make mistakes and even make them potentially in the public sphere without people, you know, holding it over their heads forever. Like, stupid shit that happened with our generation's child stars. Like, I remember people getting mad when they found out Miley Cyrus, like, was smoking weed for the first time. Or, like, there was there was a lot of people that got um, caught up smoking salvia, which is, you know, like, a, I don't even know what it is, to be honest. <laughs> but I don't know what it is either. <laughs> yeah. And um, it's stupid. It's just stupid. This is what young people do and they should be allowed to experiment and be young without like having that held over their heads forever because that's going to be trauma later yeah and like well to compare that one of the things i saw people say that they were upset about walker with is because a video of him got leaked of him playing video games with his little brother where he was swearing and and like there's also a video like that with an actor friend of his where the actor friend was like streaming like on the internet and he didn't know that and it was very obvious he didn't know that because he sounded all excited and then when the guy said he was streaming he just like said nothing for 10 seconds and mm -hmm. that's like the only thing i ever saw of that because i just i just feel uncomfortable watching them when they're just like trying to be normal kids just mm -hmm. like hanging out with their friends and I guess he swore a couple times accidentally when he was on that like a year ago. That's <laughs> weird. Whatever. Um, and so like they're, he's a person. <laughs> like yeah. these kids are all people and it's super weird to hold it against him that he was swearing in something when somebody else put that out on the internet for, for people to see not him and so like he didn't want people to see that do you really think that he wanted people to see a stream of him playing video games with his little brother well and like watch the adam project the kid drops so many swears in that like that it's, child definitely yeah. swears a lot he definitely does i feel like you can't be percy if you don't swear mm -hmm. and because of just the personality of him he watched Deadpool so many times that he memorized the entire thing when he was in fourth grade. Like somebody like that is definitely going to swear a lot. I also swore a lot when I was younger and still do now. And so it's not a big, it's not a big deal at all, but it was just that whole like weird purity culture esque thing. Like yeah. don't be like, don't be the Disney executives <laughs> that tell these kids that they're not allowed to swear or they're not allowed to like post silly TikToks when they're out with their friends, like drinking while they're at a restaurant having fun. Like they have those people telling them stuff like that, but you guys shouldn't do that, <laughs> especially if you're like actually their age and you know what it's like to need to like blow off some steam with your friends when you don't have the internet also like judging you for whatever you post <laughs> at that level. Yeah, it's so stupid. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what we have for cast news right now. Um, you know, I saw a post right before I logged on that I wanted to bring up too. It was half blood memes. They posted one of those like it was another one of those Percy and Luke are two sides of the same coin ones. They said the difference was the amount of support they had, though, which I thought was interesting. And then, you know, the way that they used the support they have is, of course, Luke goes the revenge route and Percy goes, they said the forgiveness route. I don't necessarily know that forgiveness is the right word. No, um, one thing like I guess we haven't really talked about this when it comes to Luke, because we haven't gotten to the the last books where that kind of stuff comes in. 
Mm -hmm. But I think people project a lot onto like their ideas of what they think happened with Luke on onto Percy and also onto like Rick Riordan um, with how he wrote the story. Like I referenced like that quote I read by him where he said like everyone has a has the opportunity to like redeem themselves and he said like I'm not that sounds religious. I don't mean it to sound religious, but he's like, you know, it's sad that it's always really sad when people have opportunities to like redeem their past behavior and stop what they're doing and they don't and they choose not to. And he was basically answering somebody who was asking, like, do you think Luke would be redeemed in like the afterlife? And he was saying like, yeah, he was never redeemed in my books, but I hope that he could be in the next life that he gets to live. And so that is not somebody who went through like a redemption arc. That is not someone who was ever redeemed. That's not someone who the main character in the books would look at him with like forgiveness. Like the only reason that Percy didn't stab Luke to death is because he did it first. And like, thankfully he did it to himself so that he didn't force Percy to do that. But Percy thought he was going to have to do that and would have done that if Luke didn't take himself out. And like nowhere in any of the books, like does Percy even think about Luke in a positive way? Yeah. Past like after the scorpion scene, it's over. Like there's no scenes like that with him. And so like people I think want there to be, like they want Luke to be a good guy that just got lost along the way. And and they want to believe that like, oh, Percy and Annabeth forgave him at the end. And it's like, no, that never actually really happened. He just realized that he lost and killed himself. So that he, so that Kronos would die. That's, that's it. Like he didn't actually, there wasn't that stuff happening. And I think it's one of those weird things like, to shit on JK Rowling, which I can never do enough. It, like, it's like the whole thing with Snape. Yeah. Where, like, with the whole, did you ever, oh, did you always love me? Yes. I always loved you, even when I was calling you a racial slur. And so, like, people read that in the last book and they, like, took their opinion of Snape and, like, retroactively tried to make everything that he did in the past okay or better or made him, like, not that bad. And, even though that absolutely makes zero less than zero sense when you're actually reading those books like i read that and i was like you're still a horrible fucking person who horribly bullied a child because his dad looked like he looks like his dad yeah when you were in a death cult who was trying to fascistly like exterminate an entire group of people out of the world and you think that his dad is mean because he was because he teased you one time. And so it's like, why would I, why would I think that he's a nice person? He's obviously still not, he's still a horrible person. It's nice that he did something, one nice thing, but that doesn't change every other thing he ever did. Yeah. And, I, and I think it's interesting how people like want those people to have like something good in them. Like this is a whole, I hate this whole idea, obviously because of my life. But it's that whole thing of like, people want to boat. This is like an off tangent, but there's somebody that I really like who talks sometimes about the child abuse they went through as a kid. And, mm -hmm. um, and they had this video go like big time viral of her telling a story because of that pink tote trend mm -hmm. that's been going around of a time when I don't, I didn't watch it because it wouldn't be a good idea for me to watch, but it was a time when her dad started like physically hurt, like beating her because of something that doesn't matter at all, you know, how it always goes. And somebody in her comments was like, was like saying like, oh, if that was me, I would have fought back. And I responded being like, do you think that we don't fight back? Like, do you think that when our parents are doing that, we just like sit back and cry and be like, and just let them do it of course we fight back like we fight back the entire time but it's more like people have this idea that if uh anyone is abusing a child especially physically that if they would if we would fight back against them they would just stop 
Mm-hmm. because they would realize that what you're doing is wrong and it's like no the reason why the abuse gets worse when you get older is because they literally fight they have to fight you harder because you're bigger and you can take them out <laughs> and yeah. or like have an easier time taking them out because you're bigger now and you're not as small and so the abuse gets worse as you get older because they have to do more to you to like stop you like mm-hmm. they know what you're doing is hurting you they literally watch you watch it happening to you and sometimes if they're like my dad they enjoy it they like literally enjoy watching you be in pain and so like they're they definitely watch and they definitely know and they watch you fight against them and they like they know that they could that they're fighting a literal child but they don't care but it's more of just that general idea people have that like if Oh, if you just tell an abusive person to stop and that they're hurting you, they'll obviously just stop. And it's like, no, they won't. Like, where do you live? Live in reality. That is, if it was that easy to get those people to stop, do you really think that any kid would spend their entire childhood being abused if all we had to do is ask them to stop Mm -hmm. or like fight against them? And it's that idea that I feel like people have about Luke. It's like, oh, well, it if someone would have just told Luke that that they loved him, that he would have just stopped. And it's like, people told him that all the time. And then he tried to kill them. Yeah. Literally sometimes in the same scene, (laughs) like the end of the sea of monsters scene is a bunch of kids who all said, like, we care about you. They even say that in the run up to that scene. And he's like, anyway, I want to watch you all die. And so it's like, no, I, I need people to understand that, I I just really wish that people would stop believing that. I know that it's like a coping mechanism for them because they don't like to believe how bad it really is. Yeah. They would just realize that, that like, no, they know what's going on. And especially a character like Luke, he, as much as you want him to be like a good guy that just got lost along the way, that is not his story. Mm Mm-hmm. There really isn't any like anything in the books that give you that idea either. Like we're reading them right now and they're the first three, at least (sighs) there's nothing there that gives anyone any idea that he could be saved. Yeah. It's like the opposite way of how do we stop him before he kills everybody? Yeah, it's hard to imagine Percy ever getting that lost because he has his mom and because, like, that has been such a big influence on his life thus far that, yeah. And I will say that this is one of those things that people don't like to admit either is the same kind of idea, I guess. But um, people, I think, want to believe that you can be that bad of a person very easily, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like, it there are many times in people's lives where you do things and you see that you're hurting somebody. And most people, when they see that, no matter how mad they are at that person or how wrapped up in their own stuff they are, they stop because they realize I don't want to do this to this person. I feel really bad. And no matter how bad this, I think this person is, I don't want to, I don't want to treat somebody this way. There are like lines that people have that they won't cross. It's not actually that common for somebody to like reach those points and not care and just keep going. Yeah. And so that's also a thing with people is I think they want to people want to believe that it would be very easy for someone to end up like Luke because they don't want to see the reality of like, no, he chose to be like that. And there is basically nothing that anyone could have done to Percy that would have let him becoming like that that's just not his personality he's an overly empathetic abuse victim like he feels guilty about killing monsters that are trying to kill him Mm -hmm. in the story sometimes like he empathizes with them like as much as he does with the people in his life they're trying to kill him and he empathizes with them like i i know i did a post about this the other day but like the medusa version of the show he's like sitting there listening to her say that your dad raped me and he's just sitting he's a 13 year 12 year old child and he's just listening to her say that he's not being like you're wrong he says like i've never heard my mom didn't talk about my dad that way 
but he's like listening to her say that and he's not like reacting or telling her to be quiet or telling her that she's wrong like annabeth is actually in that episode he's just listening to her and he empathizes with her and he doesn't want to have to kill her like okay. they eventually have to because she goes after you know his friends um yeah. but he doesn't want to and so and that's like a monster that is there purposely to kill him and he's still talking to her that way like she's uh somebody that he should listen to and respect and so somebody like that is no matter what like is there's nothing that can i can say this like definitively from the experience in my life there is nothing that you can go through that will actually like destroy who you are as like a core person completely Mm -hmm. that thing about you like if you're like an empathetic caring person that part of you will always be there they cannot get rid of it there is nothing that abusive people can do to actually get rid of that they try really hard but they can't and that's what that makes them angry <laughs> really angry a lot of the time that they can't but no matter what they can't actually take that out of you that is always there and so like percy was never going to be somebody like that and honestly, most of the kids in this world wouldn't be willing to do things like that because a lot of them didn't like what Luke was asking them to do and they didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And like, that's a big part of the last two books of people like that coming to Percy and talking to him about stuff and them saying like, I don't like doing this stuff, but I feel like I don't have a choice or being manipulated and acknowledging that Luke manipulated him. Like, no, I don't think anyone else in this whole like universe would have done the things that he did because he just had the right kind of personality um to end up doing what he did the other kids just like i don't think they could have done it yeah yeah <sighs> um let's see do we have any more fan stuff before we move on to epic um I think that might be it for right now because i haven't seen any other clips or anything but also i've been a little too busy to look no there hasn't been any anything else going on um the only thing is that the show is about halfway done at this point with filming if that makes you excited the director of the cinematographer posted another picture where they of polythemus's island mm -hmm. um, that was really pretty when they were filming there um but that's pretty much all that's been happening until today when they dropped everything <laughs> yeah yeah so we'll probably get like you said a new trailer pretty soon mm -hmm. um they've given us enough of the casting announcements that they could they could fit a lot in without giving too much away yeah yeah they that's the fun of um i remember the first uh the first trailer with walker doing like the the voiceover from the from the books mm -hmm. like the voiceover is what made everybody cry including me just like hearing it being done and like all they showed in like that first trailer was like pictures of camp half blood and it was mainly just it wasn't i don't even think they showed any of the other like actors <laughs> like in in character it was mostly just like the buildings and it was like an accurate camp half blood mm -hmm. and that made people cry because of how bad the movies were <laughs> and we were like oh my god thank you jesus um that like something is actually accurate and they showed him as percy like walking through the camp and getting to like poseidon's cabin and that's like where it cut off Mm -hmm. And so, like, because these books are these, this is obviously something being adapted from a book where everybody knows what happened in the book. They can give like the tiniest little things, and that will be enough for all of us to be like trying to figure out what scenes those are from, or or what things they have changed. Um, in in the TV show version, to keep everybody entertained for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we did it with like literally two seconds of a Disney Plus promo that included other things last week. So, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, but let's moving on to Epic. We did watch four more of the animations, and 
what we watched covered basically the whole Aeolus arc, um, which like immediately after they leave Polyphemus's island. So I kind of wanted to start with some Odyssey stuff. I don't like to do the whole like, oh, they're not accurate to it. I'm not doing it for that purpose, but more to be like, I can understand why these changes were made. Um, but I feel like something that they could have still kept in with how they did this version is exactly what Polyphemus's prayer to Poseidon was after Odysseus leaves. And it was, you know, grant that Odysseus never reaches home. And if he does, that it he comes home late was like the, the verbiage, but you know, it takes a very long time. He loses all of his men. He comes home a broken man and he comes home to his house being in ruin, essentially. And all of those things are what happen. And he, um, like that part, I feel like could have been left in there still and it would have fit. But um, what we start off with in, in the ones we watch this one, first song is The Storm. And this is quite obviously a storm sent by Poseidon because of Polyphemus's prayer. And um, Odysseus doesn't know it yet, though. He's just like, you know, let's, let's prepare for a storm bigger than anything we've ever seen. Um, he tells, you know, like his men, follow my ship and I'll try to lead us through the waves and we'll find some land to land on. Um, the crew is losing hope though at this point because of how bad this storm is. And at the end of the song, they spot a floating island, which is Aeolia, the island that Aeolus, the god of winds, which they changed to a female. I, and I don't have a problem with that because the voice was very beautiful um but yeah they that's when they see aeolia at the end of the song and um so odysseus orders them to harpoon to the island and um like the one canon thing where it's like okay i don't know about this they don't say how they get on the floating island like they never say that so the harpoons is creative um but the description of aeolia does include that it's surrounded by walls of bronze so I don't know where they would harpoon to. Um, it didn't have it obviously in the animation and and this is a change from the original, but yeah, it's just interesting that it's a floating island and they never quite say how they got there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that floating necessarily means the sky here. I'd probably have to look at the original Greek word that they used. And even then that might not give me an indication. I don't know. And well, was it in the first song when the one guy on the ship is like questioning him? That's the next song. So yeah, luck runs out and we could jump right into it because this is still before he goes on the island. Okay. Um, I just thought that was really interesting to show him manipulating him mm -hmm. because that's all that was and how he's like saying it in a way of like, I'm being a nice guy. Like, I'm being a good person. I don't want you to question me because then, like, all these other things could happen. I just need you all to support me, like, unconditionally and never question me and any of my decisions because things are going badly right now and I, and I can't, and I can't do that. Okay. Uh, it reminded me very much of, like, the corporate bosses that I have right now, now at my horrible new job where they like say horrible things to you, but they say it in like a nice voice. And you're just sitting there like looking at them, like, what did you just say to me? It felt very similar to that. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting that they show Odysseus doing that, like showing him being like, you need to stop questioning me because I don't know what else to do. Um, yeah. And kind of him being like a good person, but also that like cunningness that Athena liked at first coming out in a way that's like not fair because it's like like these people on this ship don't want to don't want to die either and you're you're basically telling them that they're not allowed to like have normal feelings mm -hmm. and like those sort of things always get worse like if you don't let people just talk about it mm -hmm. and so it was just like really interesting to see like him being like the the like the nice person that whole song and then at the very end 
Um, when the guy thinks that he's going to come and talk to him and talk out what his issues are so they can resolve them, instead he's like, never question me. Yeah, so I I believe the person who is supposed to be is Yuri Locus, which is Yuri Locus. I think I'm saying the emphasis wrong. Yuri Locus, um, who is his second in command, which like that's what it says in the back of my copy of the Odyssey. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, yeah, he is... He's very much, you know, saying, what if your luck's about to run out, you know, and when Odysseus is like, okay, but the floating island, we know what that place is supposed to be, so let's just go and ask for help. And um, Eurylochus is like, okay, but don't forget how dangerous the gods are. Like, and we just had this whole conflict with Athena, so 100%, don't forget how dangerous the gods are. (laughs) You just had a fight with one. That's like, Uh, that's a very valid point to be making, like, our whole way home got messed up because of you getting in this fight with Athena. The whole reason why we're here is because of Athena, like, sending you here. And now you get away from Athena, and now you're immediately just getting involved with another one of them. (laughs) Like, this doesn't sound like a good idea. Yeah. Um, Let's see. So, and Odysseus's speech in this... I tried to fact check this, but I don't think there's actual numbers. Um, Part of what Odysseus says to try to like say, just trust me, is that he took 600 men to war and not one of them died. I don't think that that's necessarily true. I couldn't find an actual count of how many people died in Troy, but I sincerely doubt that nobody from the Ithaca team that came to Troy died. Um, And yeah at this point because they've already been to the lotus eaters i want to say that some men got left behind on the isle of the lotus eaters um polyphemus ate at least six of them Mm -hmm. and um i want to say they ran into one more encounter where they lost people already too but that's just kind of forgotten here (laughs) you know like I have lost men. Uh, my logic doesn't always get everybody out of tight spaces, but at least it gets me out of tight spaces is kind of the Odysseus vibe. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting considering the saga, the Cyclops saga that we listened to last week, where he was really sad and really emotional about how Polythemus killed some of his men. And he was like, I need to like never forget any of you. And make sure that I respect you and your like your memory forever and and because of what because of how you were killed because of decisions I made and I was like listening to this being like is this like some weird thing where he feels like he needs to prove that he's like big and strong and tough because Athena isn't around anymore and Athena got mad at him and was like bye you can handle everything on your own now or or what yeah. because it feels very like because it's not at all how he was like literally the last time <laughs> he wasn't like that and now this time he's like no one's ever died under my name so you shouldn't question me and it's like what about those people that died a couple of days ago <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> well i don't get that i don't know for some reason i get the sense that at least this version of odysseus is while he is cunning he's also naive and I don't know if this is being colored by my current watching of Hunter Hunter because like one of the main characters Gone is extremely naive, but he tends to come up with the plans that save their asses in the first season. <laughs> and so um, like I'm kind of getting that sense from at least this version of Odysseus. And I see this whole like, you know, let's go ask this other god for help as toxic hope- hopefulness mm-hmm. in a way. Um, because hopefulness can be a bad thing. One thing that like gets debated in classes where you talk about mythology, especially um, the Pandora's jar thing, is that hope was in that jar. Like, you know, the embodiment of hope. Mm-hmm. And it gets shut back into the jar. But like, why was hope in the jar full of bad things, you know? Yeah, like, like I think it's a thing of like, the one song we're talking about, they showed him remembering like his wife okay. and thinking about like, I'm so different from who I was when I was with you. 
but I'm also not. And I just want to go back home and be able to be like a dad to my kid and, and be with you again. That sort of thing is like, it's not necessarily hopefulness. It's more of just like, I just want this to happen because I want it to happen sort of thing. Like when you're so desperate for something to happen in your life that you really want, it like supersedes like the other parts of your brain that usually warns you when maybe that doesn't like match up. Yeah. What's actually going on. Like weirdly, this reminds me of like all the astrologers who made all these predictions that like Kamala would win the election or that if Trump won that they would find out actually that he didn't win. And like the days after the election, obviously none of those things were true. And it's like, they just, they wanted so badly for her to win that they just ignored the things that were there that show that it's possible that he would win. Mm -hmm. And like the people that I really like didn't really say one way or another because they're like, both of them have things where they could win. So I feel like I can't really say which one it's going to be. And it, it's the, like Odysseus is kind of doing the same thing where like he so badly wants to go home and see his wife that he's willing to just like do these really risky things that he usually wouldn't do and get involved with the gods because he's just so desperate to believe like yeah if i do this one thing i'll just magically get home and it's like nothing is ever that simple and he just keeps things keep getting worse because he just keeps doing that over and over and over again (laughs) yeah well um before we get into the next song though i want to go into the odyssey like what happens with aeolus is very very short it doesn't even take up I, they're not called chapters in in ancient epics. They're called like books. So it doesn't even take up a whole book in itself. It's probably a couple of paragraphs. But um, so Odysseus stays in Aeolia for one month because Aeolus is trying to entertain him and ask him about all of like what happened in the war and getting all the stories from him. It's essentially why you had that guest host relationship was because. It was a way to get your news. (laughs) And so um, then he gives him the the bag of winds and it has all of the storm winds except for the west wind, which I believe is Zephyr. Um, And after that, they sail nine days and nights, um, almost make it home. Like literally Ithaca is in sight. They can see men on the shore making fires and stuff. And the reason that the men open the bag of wings in the Odyssey, at least, is just out of pure jealousy. Like, they were told nothing about what the bags contained, and they just know that Odysseus left Aeolia with stuff. And they're like, well, this guy keeps bringing stuff home. Um, why, why don't we get a slice of that? Let's see what's in this bag. And, you know, Odysseus just can and like i believe his internal monologue was i could jump off the ship but potentially die or i could just stand here helplessly while these winds are blowing Mm -hmm. um but anyway getting into the next song it's called keep your friends close and it's mostly sung by aeolus who in this version is female um and odysseus asks her for perfect winds to sail home um and she says let's play a game And that's when she says, the game is, you can't open the bag. Um, And so she does tell him it contains all of the wings. Um, But then these little wind creatures that are hanging around her, once Odysseus gets back on the ship with the bag, they're like, it's treasure, (laughs) which I kind of like that. It's it's a different (laughs) way of explaining why the men did what they did, but it's, it's interesting. But this forces Odysseus to have to stay up that entire nine days and nights that they're sailing because now these men think that he has treasure because of those stupid little wind guys. <laughs> it feels like very accurate for like Greek mythology for like the wind people to just like cause chaos to be like, he has gold in there that he's trying to keep like keep from you. That's absolutely something that spirits in Greek mythology would do. So that felt very accurate. And I I just thought that was really an interesting way that they set this up where they had the songs about him, like manipulating his first man, basically. And it's like that whole thing of like, yeah, if you would have talked to that guy and like listened to his problems and not just like shut him down, Mm -hmm. this probably wouldn't have happened because you would have actually dealt like 
you would have built up real trust with him, he would have realized that you really were on his team and on the rest of their team. But mm -hmm. because you didn't do that and you tried to just like kind of intimidate them into just never questioning you, they absolutely did this <laughs> because that's what people do. Like when they don't trust, they don't trust you. You haven't done something that made them feel like they can trust you. And so they're gonna like question everything you say because they don't, they don't know what you're really doing. Yeah, like you said it perfectly when you're like, it, it reminds you of toxic bosses and how they try to do that. Because I know, I don't know if it's like a neurodivergent thing or an Aquarius placement thing, but being the one person that's not afraid to be negative on the team, like, it's a hard place to be. And I remember, like, in stupid team working exercises, it's always like, oh, you're honest, you're authentic. But like what they're really saying is, oh, you don't bullshit us like everybody else. Like, yeah, I don't. Thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, you're the one that gets pulled aside and like, hey, your ideas are great and all and your points are valid. But like, we really need to stay positive here. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, I, it does not lead to trust. That's me too with at any job ever. Like, I'm usually the one that will try to say something or I've learned in the years now because I'm like, I, I just need to not be homeless that I just like don't say anything to any of the people that I work with because I don't I don't want to pretend and like I can't I like physically can't. And so like when I I know that the jobs that I have don't treat me well and the people that are our managers and stuff don't actually care about us like that like they're always your boss no matter how nice they are to you they're always your boss and that always supersedes any any other like relationship you think you have with them and so i always keep everybody like away and i don't i don't even try to like be friend like necessarily make friends with the people that i work with even work from home people anymore because that stuff happens so often yeah. yeah, I don't want to be the person that like makes everyone else feel bad or whatever, but I just know that's how these sort of things go like the job that fired me last year I was remembering how there was a lot of people in my department that were doing all of this extra work like they were basically being managers, but they were not like managers at all they were not like they didn't have that position they weren't being paid for it. And it, when people would ask questions about something that they were stuck on they would answer the questions and they would go and do research if they couldn't figure it out and they would do all this stuff to help everybody else they came up with this whole system of how each there's like four of them that they would all like take turns being the one that would answer everybody's questions on a certain day and then when our department got like sent overseas all of us were fired mm -hmm. like, all of those people were fired all of like those people that did all of that extra work were told that they had to either work in the call center or they didn't have a job anymore. And all of them just like, just quit. And cause they didn't want to work in the call center. So like all of that extra work went to nowhere. Like it didn't actually do anything for them. And that's what this stuff, like this kind of thing, like reminds me of, of Odysseus being like, if you're a good little soldier, things will pay off. And they're like, no, it's not. Like you're not, you're like keeping things from us. You're not telling us what's going on. You're sending us and like putting us in these dangerous positions. Like when I was watching like the, the animations, mm -hmm. I was like waiting for Odysseus to realize how stupid it was to make Poseidon mad when you're on the ocean. Like, is that really the time when you want to piss him off mm -hmm. is when you're literally on a boat in the middle of the ocean? you have nowhere else to go but the ocean and this is the time when you're going to kill one of or almost kill mess up one of his kids and steal his food and then leave him as destitute with nothing and then leave and think that he's just gonna like let you do that like where is your brain <laughs> like of course he's not gonna let you do that but it's just one of those things of of course they would be looking at him like you keep getting us involved in all of these things because you're so desperate to see your wife again and it's like well what about me yeah and my life i don't want to go through that anymore
Yeah, hold on, my phone's not charging. There we go, okay. Um, yeah, like you would think, okay, it would be hard first to have that kind of relationship with every man considering he has multiple fleets of ships. But like, I do think at least with your Yuri Loc, your, why do I just wanna say Yuri Locus? Yuri Locus, he should, you know, be more willing to like, because that's his first in command. That's the person you really want on your side and want to like, listen to you and who you need to be your, your brain essentially when you can't captain anymore because being a full-time captain on the seas has to be hard, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how many times in like Star Trek does like card, you know, leave Riker in charge and stuff. So um, there's there's just like a lot involved with being constantly at sea, I'm sure, where you need your top crew members to understand where you're coming from and have that level of trust with you. Yeah, and one thing we can say too from our time working for corporate jobs or just yeah. jobs at all is that people will fall in line if there's like one of you that's at the same level as you and they and they feel like they can really trust that their boss or whoever it is who's in charge everyone else would just go along with it yeah so like it it really honestly wouldn't have taken that much for him to get all of his men to be behind him but he was just too he was getting too wrapped up in thinking about like him like i want to see my baby i want to see my wife and it's like yes you do but also all these other people on the ship have things like that in their life too mm -hmm. and if you get too focused on like what you're missing when you're a leader you start making mistakes like this exactly um yeah so we have odysseus because he doesn't have this level of trust having to stay up the entire nine days and nights that they are sailing to ithaca and once it's in the line of sight, he falls asleep. And we see this dream sequence with Penelope and Telemachus and him dreaming of going home and being the husband and the father he didn't get a chance to be. But then like dream Penelope wakes him up and is like, you need to wake up, they're opening the bag. And um, so the bag, as it's blowing them away, Aeolus lets them know it's going to blow them to the land of the giants, which I think is the Lystragodians, which they're referring to. And Odysseus ends up closing the last of the winds in this version, like he closes up a little bit of the winds somehow. And the very last thing we see at the end of this animation is a trident, um, which brings us into Ruthlessness, which I loved this song. This is my current favorite, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, so I love some of the imagery, like the horses being like literal waves and stuff. Um, this is where we get the reveal that Polyphemus is um, Poseidon's son, which Odysseus, I believe, did know. I would say the first time it's mentioned is right after he blinds Polyphemus and the whole nobody sequence. Um, the, the other Cyclopes, as he's like screaming for help, or like, well, if nobody's hurting you, why don't you pray to your dad, Poseidon, <laughs> you know? Um, so, and I think P Polyphemus even says his curses out loud to Odysseus at one point and says like, I'm gonna tell my dad on you essentially. Um, so Odysseus did know the entire time, um, but we have a difference in motivation between the book and the, uh, the musical in that this Odysseus, did what he did seemingly out of mercy. He didn't kill Polyphemus out of mercy and out of a rebellion because he was tired of the gods ordering him around and him having to deal with the emotional fallout that came with that. Um, so um, the, like, the chorus is ruthlessness is mercy upon ourselves. The point being that he should have taken out Polyphemus that like, that would have been the more merciful thing to do himself because look at all this trouble that's been caused because he couldn't just finish the job. Um, and I loved some of the lyrics in it. Like I wrote down some of the lyrics because I, I thought it was that good. So um, Poseidon tells him you're the worst kind of good because you're not even great. Um, he, he specifically calls out false righteousness 
and says um, that he fights to save lives, but won't kill and he won't get the job done. And that is a reoccurring trope with heroes that I just love. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a bit in the book and the, um, the musical in that this Odysseus did what he did seemingly out of mercy. He didn't kill Polyphemus out of mercy and out of a rebellion because he was tired of the gods ordering him around and him having to deal with the emotional fallout that came with that. Um, so, um, the, like, the chorus is ruthlessness is mercy upon ourselves, the point being that he should have taken out Polyphemus, that, like, that would have been the more merciful thing to do himself because look at all this trouble that's been caused because he couldn't just finish the job. Um, and I loved some of the lyrics in it. Like I wrote down some of the lyrics because I, I thought it was that good. So um, Poseidon tells him you're the worst kind of good because you're not even great. Um, he, he specifically calls out false righteousness and says um, that he fights to save lives but won't kill and he won't get the job done. And that is a reoccurring trope with heroes that I just love. Um, so I wanted to talk about that a bit. I know yeah. you had an example, I'll let you go with your example. There's honestly, there's so many examples of that because that's like part of the hero sort of archetype. And I think it's fun. I loved this song and like Poseidon because <laughs> I, I, uh, I would always say every like, you know, those quizzes where they're like, oh, what cabin would you be in in Percy Jackson? Mm -hmm. I'm always in the Poseidon cabin and I'm not trying to pick it on purpose. I've done like four of them and they always, it always ends up with Poseidon. And so I was watching this and I was like, I love watching Poseidon just get really fucking angry and go after Odysseus and his men and be like, fuck you, you hurt my kid. Why should I be nice to you? Like that, like sort of like rage you feel, especially like the kind of stereotype of like when you're a water sign sort of person that like we can be very emotional and like empathetic, but also if you're mean to somebody we care about, I will absolutely stab you to death and will not feel bad about doing it at all because I feel like I you gave me permission to be horrible to you by being so horrible to somebody that I care about. Mm -hmm. That's basically what Poseidon is doing doing during this song. And I'm like, this is really fun to like watch to watch him just be like, how dare you do this and expect me to just like let you do this to my kid? Like what is wrong with you that you knew this about him and just did this anyway? Mm -hmm. Um the thing I think is really interesting with heroes is the times when heroes do that because they almost like feel bad mm -hmm. about like hurting somebody. They realize that they shouldn't have done that. And so they don't want to kill them completely because they have like guilt about how they hurt them already. Like, and I think that's honestly where it more was with Odysseus of he knew that doing that to Polythemus was not the right thing to do. And so we felt like if he killed him all the way that that would have made it worse because he would have felt worse. Mm -hmm. But then there also are heroes that don't kill those people because they want to give them like another chance. And they mm -hmm. want to give them like the chance to like change and make a different choice, which is like my favorite part of heroes like um, I'm trying to think of all of them like um, Frodo doesn't kill Gollum. Mm -hmm. in Lord of the Rings, like Sam wants him to because Sam has every reason to hate Gollum, but Frodo doesn't want to because he sees parts of himself in Gollum and he wants to believe that he could be, he could come back from having to go through everything that he is. And so he doesn't want to kill Gollum. They, Gollum ends up like cutting off some of his fingers and ends up basically killing himself by falling into the volcano because he keeps trying to kill him to get the to get the ring back and so that's a time that happens and then like in star wars like luke doesn't try to kill vader um he doesn't even he doesn't even try to kill the emperor and even what my one of my favorite like star wars moments like ever in the last jedi is when luke like 
basically astral projects himself and kylo is in such a rage that he does not realize that luke is not even there because mm -hmm. he's so angry at him and is just so wrapped up in wanting to hurt him that he doesn't like luke never touches him because he's never actually there and he still beats him mm -hmm. in like their fight when he's not even physically there and it's like one of my favorite moments with him is that even with that, when it's his nephew that's trying to literally kill everybody, he still is like, I'm not gonna actually fight you. And it's not him being like, oh, you're too scared to fight me or you can't like handle the consequences. Like Luke is the, like he, at that point, especially, he knows that a bunch of kids all were murdered by his nephew because he felt like he let them down as a mentor, as a teacher, and that those people are all dead because of him. And so he's not somebody who doesn't understand the responsibility of what he's doing, but it's just one of those things of, I'm not gonna fight you because I don't, that wouldn't like do anything. Like you're my nephew or like with Vader, like you're my father and, or the, even like the emperor, like you want me to be angry at you. You want me to like fight back at you, but I'm only gonna do it if I feel like I have to protect somebody. Like in Return of the Jedi, the only time Luke gets angry and like fights back is when um, the emperor or not the emperor, when Vader brings up Leia mm -hmm. and it mentions that, oh, Leia is your sister. I could go find her and he's like absolutely not i will kill you and that's like the time when he gets so upset that he like cuts off vader's hand and stops because it reminds him of how he has a robotic hand too and he stops himself but like he doesn't get angry at them be over himself he gets angry at them protecting his sister that's the thing that makes him really upset and it's not like a thing of like i want to beat you it's like i need to stop you from hurting my sister and so that's that kind of thing with heroes is always really interesting to me like percy also does that like he doesn't he doesn't kill try to kill luke he doesn't like luke takes himself out but he doesn't want to he like knows that luke is gonna have to die one day and he's pretty sure that he's gonna be the one to have to do it mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to do that he wants luke to just stop and but he's also aware that he's not going to but he's he's not like not killing him because he thinks i don't know he's like trying almost to hope that he will somehow stop or somebody else will stop him so that he doesn't have to be the one to do it and so a lot of things like heroes in everything that you can ever imagine that they do is there's always a time when they could just take the person out and sometimes people are like oh you should have done that because then they went on to like hurt a bunch of other people mm -hmm. but i always love those those that's why i always like the hero characters the most because it's a really complicated thing to see somebody that's a horrible person that's hurt a lot of people and but still want to give them another chance to stop even if you think that it's unlikely that they will you give them like every possible opportunity to do that anyway and mm -hmm. until you have no other choice because that's just i think that's always the right thing to do with people and like granted you know i had my dad growing up and that's very much what i was like with him was i wanted to believe that at some point he would like wake up or stop or whatever and eventually his brain broke and he got dementia and that i guess happened but like I want that was part of that's something that I always like am very that's one of those things that I just have a lot of like strong opinions on mm -hmm. is like like I don't like that we have the death penalty in the same sort of way like I don't think that anyone who does any crime should be even the worst I don't think that anyone even the absolute worst should be like thrown into prison for the rest of their life and never have a chance to ever get out um or at least have like some sort of chance to like actually rehabilitate. Like some people don't want to rehabilitate and those people can go somewhere else but a horrible prison and live out the rest of their life there. But even with people like that, I just don't think that there's a point to that. I don't want people to like suffer over and over again forever or I don't, 
I guess I just don't see a point in like feeling like you're morally superior to them. Because yeah. I guess most of the time for me, I just know that most people who think that way really aren't. Like people want to believe that they wouldn't do the things that those people do. Um, but most of the time they're just like writing fan fiction. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, oh, if I was in an abusive situation, I would get out of it or I would tell somebody about it right away. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't. Like, please stop talking because I, I know that that's not true. And that's just something that people kind of, I think they say to themselves to like make themselves feel safer or something to imagine that they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to like heroes, that's what heroes really are in media. And I think that it's so interesting that a lot of people think that heroes are the boring characters. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite characters are always like Percy or Aang in mm -hmm. Travelous Airbender or Luke in Star Wars or like Rey and Finn in Star Wars or um, my favorite storyline in Lord of the Rings is Frodo and Sam and people used to say forever that that was that's the most boring storyline and um, there's probably there's other characters like that and other things that but I just can't remember it right now. Oh. Like Captain America, like Steve Rogers, people, there are a lot of people who think that Steve Rogers is boring or corny or, or whatever. Um, I love all of those characters. Those are the most interesting, like complex, like multifaceted characters to me. It genuinely confuses me that people think they're boring and mm -hmm. that they only think they're interesting if they imagine them going bad. That's usually the thing that people like the most is imagining that. And I genuinely don't understand um, because it's like you're taking away all the really interesting, complex things about them as a person and making them like everybody else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. But like, <laughs> well, I guess with, cause you brought up Avatar, like Azula is a really good chance. Like Zuko well, would have been a horrible, horrible if you just took out Azula when she was like literally having a mental breakdown and like crying. And like the very last scene of the of the entire thing, like I just I saw a quote the other day from the act the voice actress for Zula, saying that she never has watched that scene back because she had to like think of things from her actual life to like tap into those emotions, and it made her so upset having to do that that she has never watched the scene again because mm -hmm. it just reminds her of how she felt in that moment. And like, no, it was not right for Zuko to to have like killed Azula in that moment, it wouldn't have been right for Aang to take out Sozin um, when he was- Ozai. Oh, sorry, Ozai, when he was literally like powerless okay. and had nothing. Like that, it's like the people who go like on safaris and kill lions, but like lions literally let you walk right up to them. They're big cats. You can walk right up to a lion and it won't do anything to you. So like coming home with a like a lion head is the easiest thing in the world because they'll just let you kill them because they don't realize you're doing that until you've already done it. And so it's that sort of a thing of like, yeah, I guess you could kill that person, but they're like weak and have nothing. So like, what is the point of doing that to them? Doesn't that make me like, like the villain that I hate if I just take out like powerless, weak people that can't fight back? Yeah, Azula is an interesting example of that. So I know you haven't read the comics. Um, Azula still causes trouble in the comics. I'll just say that without spoiling it if you ever do get a chance to read them. Um, Ozai is completely powerless. There is like one comic where Zuko's feeling conflict in his new leadership role, and he goes to literally everyone for advice, including Ozai at one point but he doesn't necessarily follow his advice. Um, so Ozai was left completely powerless. Azula was not. And like, that's the difference where she still has the potential to hurt people as much as she has the potential to reform. Of course, as a, a former golden child myself, I would love her to have a redemption arc, but at least of what I've read of the comics so far, that has not happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, the other example I wanted to talk about is Batman because he is um, like my dad and my brother's special interest superhero. Um, he definitely reminds me a lot of Odysseus in some ways because his power isn't a superpower like some of the other superheroes. 
His power is, yes, money, but also intellect, it seems like, um, because he does, like, acquire a bunch of skills and stuff that make him good at what he does. Um, but he is one of those superheroes that makes it a point to not take out the bad guys, to let them go into Arkham Asylum, and they almost always get back out. Um, and the Joker is one that really makes you question whether or not this stance that he has is worth it, because the Joker just takes people out at random. The Joker doesn't even like care. You know, the Joker just wants to cause chaos. In fact, once he finds out that this is one of Batman's lines in the sand, he's like trying to push him past it, like constantly. And um, so that's one instance where it is like, okay, but is being merciful, is not taking him out and not stooping to his level really helping here? Or is it, you know, causing more harm? Because you could make that argument with some of these cases we've talked about, like that they, they will go on to cause more harm. Um, Ozai is just like a curious case where he can't. <laughs> He's like in prison and powerless. Um, I was asking both my son and my, my husband before this too about like specifically the, the Avatar one because they, they're not as familiar with Batman. And um, so William was like, yeah, Aang made the right choice because he wasn't abandoning like air nomad ideals kind of thing. And then Jake was like, yeah, I wouldn't have taken him out either, but I probably would have made it so he can't talk. He doesn't have arms or legs either so that he is completely powerless. But I, I don't know. This is just like my always way of thinking about this is that him with having no power and no way to like um, intimidate and abuse people to get them to do things for him is like the worst thing ever that he could have ever gone through yeah uh, that's like his ab absolute like worst case scenario and he had to live it dying would have been easier for him because it would have ended but mm -hmm. with this he had to like learn how it felt to be one of his victims for all of those years except that everyone treated him better than he would have treated them mm -hmm. but it still was like that's People online I know have this obsession with like accountability. And that's honestly the closest you get to accountability is like making somebody fall enough where they are in the position where they're closer to what they put other people through. You never put them through what they actually do to other people, but they at least somewhat understand what that feels like. And it's the only way for them to ever fully get like how much they hurt people. And maybe they they might still not care, but it's more like that is a better source of doing that than you just killing them. Like okay. you killing them or hurting them or whatever doesn't do anything for you. Um, it doesn't like really help you in any way. It makes, it's just something else that you have to think about and think about like, did, was that like the right decision? If I didn't do that, would they have like figured things out? Could they have like helped people? later on if they actually figured out what was really happening and they didn't fall into like these horrible things that everybody else does or like that they did before like i i honestly think that i honestly think that the best thing that ever happened to my dad was getting the dementia mm -hmm. where he couldn't talk anymore he couldn't communicate anymore he couldn't do anything at all like anything at all anymore he like couldn't he couldn't do anything and was just like completely helpless and had to completely depend on the people that would still talk to him which was my mom and me and my sister no one else would talk to him if my mom and me and my sister did not talk to him he would have died homeless because there was literally no one else that wanted to even like put up with him anymore and i honestly think that the best thing that ever happened to him was that he ended up dying in a nursing home where he couldn't talk and he couldn't communicate. He couldn't say anything. And so like those last couple years for me was nice because when he did talk, he would say like nice things mm -hmm. to me. Like he would say that he loved me and things like that. And I honestly think during that time that was him almost like brought like to the absolute like bottom of the barrel where he could, his mind wasn't even working. He couldn't even like say a sentence out loud. 
or walk anymore or do anything at all and it was like him almost realizing like wow you guys are like still here even though i've treated you like the worst that anyone could ever go through but you're still here when i'm in this place and still trying to take care of me and like yeah that horrible part of him never completely went away like when he was when he was in one of those nursing home places, they the he, they wanted my mom to go into a room with him with a with a guard mm -hmm. because they were afraid of what he would do to her when he had dementia and he couldn't even talk anymore. And so it's not like he never like be, it's not like he became like a good person, mm -hmm. but I do think that him having to go through that like slapped him in the face so hard that he died like that in just like kind of like a pathetic way. And it, that was like, honestly, the best thing that could have ever happened to him. Like, I don't know if him going to prison would have actually been better than that. Because him in prison, he would have made himself a victim and would have been like, I'm such a horrible, sad victim. Look at what my daughter did to me. I, I'm here because of her. How could my daughter do this to me? Feel sad for me, feel bad for me. And when he got out, he would have like made that as a reason for why his life sucked and why his life was so hard. He would have blamed it all on me or my mom or whoever. If that would have happened, he would have blamed it on us. And it would have, he never would have had to deal with it. But since that never happened, he had to deal with the fact that it was his fault mm -hmm. that his life ended up that way. There was nobody else. We didn't do anything. And so if you ended up destitute like that, it's because of you and the choices that you made. And he had like no way of getting away from it when his brain wouldn't even work anymore. So he literally like couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, but I, that's why I think about like bad people like this. Like, I will say that I just rewatched um, the Star Wars movies with my mom and I hated the scene in Return of the Jedi when Darth Vader says like, oh, you were right about me this whole time and like apologizes and it's like, tell your sister that you were right because that never happens. <laughs> and so it made it would like made me like really mad seeing them put that into a movie because that doesn't ever actually happen. But at the same time, like Luke doing that doesn't like change everything that Anakin did up until that point in his life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make everything that he did okay. And Luke could have killed Anakin, but then he would have just become another person for the Emperor. Mm -hmm. and, or he just, it wouldn't have been, like, the whole thing of why I always loved Luke, especially in Star Wars, is because he doesn't fight in the way that people expect them to. And because he doesn't do that is the reason why things work out the way that they should. Like there's a million different ways that could have happened. And if he would have fought in any way, it never would have, it wouldn't have gone the same way. And like the whole fun thing about Return of the Jedi is that the Emperor is like, all your friends are gonna die. All of their plans are gonna work. And then their plans all start working. And on like the little planet and in like space where Luke is watching them. And so it's like they, he's literally watching in front of them, like the Emperor be wrong. And so it's like very easy for him to believe. And like, that's really what Luke does in that movie is he has hope and he believes in the faith that he has with his friends that things will work out in the end because he trusts those people with everything. And that's essentially what heroes do too, is they, Odysseus is kind of not really doing that. That's I think why he's having such a hard time in this part of the story is that he's not building that trust with the people around him, but usually that's how it works. Like, like we, I've said this a million times about Percy Jackson, but the reason why people are freaking out about him being gone and heroes of Olympus and stuff is because he, everyone like adores him to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. The And by that, I mean like the other demigod kids, they all adore him completely. And the reason why they love him so much is because the gods hate him. And so like he it's because he had all of the power, he had the opportunity to do whatever he wanted and he chose to help all of them instead. Mm -hmm. And so like that's you're going to build so much trust with people where they're going to spend six months of their lives looking for you every single day. Like yeah. the 
the first heroes, the lost hero book of the Heroes of Olympus book, literally everyone you've ever heard of is out there looking for him. They all just drop what they're doing to go find him. Like, um, like Grover is like the Lord of the wild by this point, And he stops doing that for six months when Percy is gone to go find him. And so it's like, literally everyone does that because he has, you know, built up trust with those people mm-hmm. and like backed it up with their choice, with his choices that they will literally do anything and everything for him from that point forward. And yeah. like people like, Odysseus or like the villains or whatever they almost like don't understand why people love the heroes like that so much like when people watch like Lord of the Rings for example I think a lot of people who think the storyline with Sam and Frodo are boring they almost like don't know what it's like to have like a friend that you love that much Mm -hmm. and so they feel like it's boring to watch that because they don't know what that could feel like or they or they can't connect to it emotionally or they just won't mm-hmm. and but it's like yeah that's the story of two people who love each other that much that they're willing to do all of that just to help each other out and like the saddest scene of all of lord of the rings is when frodo has to say goodbye to sam mm-hmm. like i see like TikToks of that scene not even watching the movie and i cry I yeah. sometimes cry thinking about that scene <laughs> because it's so it's such like uh, an emotional scene, um, and like it would have been so easy for one of for one of them to like for Sam to just kill Gollum, um, mm-hmm. but then it would have absolutely destroyed all of the trust that he and Frodo that Frodo had in him. Mm-hmm. And even though Frodo ended up almost dying at the very end when Gollum tried to like shove him into the into Mount Doom yeah it was worth it to do all of that even though Frodo almost died multiple times because he kept his relationship with the person he actually cared about most and I guess like I'm sure there are people out there saying like oh Sam should have just killed Gollum in in the middle of the two towers and all of this other stuff wouldn't have happened but then he wouldn't have been Sam yeah and like (laughs) The Batman stuff, I think, is so funny because I've never cared that much about Batman because his superpower is being a rich asshole, basically. And so I just like, I get it. Your parents died when you were little and there were bats involved. I understand. There's just, I can't watch that scene one more time. I I think he has a better moral compass than Tony Stark, though, okay? Yeah. (laughs) Tony is actually a really good example of that too, of, because Tony hates um, Steve Rogers. And I think it's, it's so funny in that ridiculous way, why he hates him because Tony hates Steve because of childhood trauma. (laughs) Um, Tony's dad always uh, really liked Steve and talked very nicely about him after he was gone and would talk being like Steve was like so much better at, at this than you were. He was just such a better person than you. And Tony is, you know, horrible person. And so he takes all of that out on Steve, even though he he never did anything. He was gone. He didn't he was like in ice all those years. He had no idea what his dad was doing or like mm-hmm. how he talked about him. But like basically, I think the Marvel movies particularly is like a fascinating thing about that because they definitely set up Tony. They thought that Tony was going to be like the star. Mm -hmm. Like they offered Robert Downey Jr. like $80 million (laughs) to come back again because they think that Robert Downey Jr. can like save Marvel movies. And it's like, do you understand that most people didn't like Tony or they liked the movies in spite of Tony? And actually, Tony being like the star of all of these movies kind of ruined the movies. They would have been much better if he wasn't so much like the focus. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of fascinating watching the Mar- like Marvel movies go along where they like prioritize Tony so much. And it was like, he's not an interesting character. He's a jerk. He's a billionaire who is a little like war profiteer who needs to be like taught that when you bomb people, people die. Like, he has an entire storyline about that. And then there's characters like Steve and Bucky who have nothing, were, like, super poor and disabled before they were even 
superheroes. Like they were orphans before they even like became the superhero that they were one day. Like Sam, not Sam, Steve's mom died when he was like 18 and, and his dad died in World War One. And so Steve, before he was Captain America, was an orphan who had no, who only family he had was Bucky. Okay. And so they already had nothing and grew up with nothing. And so people like that are just much more interesting to see, like, especially when they're pushed to be involved in things that they don't want to be involved in, because people just keep forcing them to be involved in these huge, like, power plays that other people are doing, including Tony. And you just want them to leave. They, you just, when you watch those movies, you just want Steve and Bucky to be able to, like, do whatever the fuck they want. Like, whatever it is, you just want them to be able to, like, relax and to stop having to like be involved in all of these things that people keep involving them in because they they're just like good people and they and there are times like bucky was brainwashed to be a serial killer basically like he had absolutely no choice in it but that's what he had what they forced him to do and he tries to kill steve many times and steve still won't hurt him like there's a whole the whole storyline between the two of them in the civil war movie is at literally everyone everyone is telling steve to turn bucky in or to fight against him if you have to kill him you might have to kill him and he's like no like over and over again he's like no no the first like interaction they have in that movie is all of these police people trying to take out bucky for like 10 minutes like the like Black Panther shows up and tries to kill him. Like all of these people are trying to kill him. His best friends are even telling him, you're probably gonna have to kill him at some point if he's not good. And he's like, no, I'm never going to kill Bucky. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you will have to kill me before I do that. Like you will actually have to kill me if you want to do that. I'm never gonna turn him in and I'm never gonna do that. And he ends up being in the right like everything that people think Bucky did in that movie, he was being set up for. He never actually did it. And so if they would have killed him, they would have killed a completely innocent person that was tortured by a like a Nazi organization for 70 years. Mm -hmm. And it, like literally everyone else in that movie is telling him to do it and he won't do it. And that's like, even if it's like, even if things like blow up like it does for them, like where they have to go on the run for two years, and they can't see anybody else and they have to hide away in these different countries and things like that from Tony <laughs> because if Tony finds out where they are he'll like he's the government's little bitch and so he'll send the government after them and try to and they'll try to throw them into prison like they even try to throw Steve into prison after like half of the universe has disappeared and he has a moment where he's like go fuck yourself bros <laughs> and he like he shows up then because he knows that they that there's way too many things going on that they can't actually do that to him mm -hmm. um but it's just that sort of interaction i always find that more interesting when i'm watching movies i'm just like yeah i guess you could be that person that just like kills people for fun or kills people because you could or kills people because you're really angry at them even if you have a justifiable reason to be angry at them but i just don't i just find that really boring yeah. I, think it's, I think it's more interesting to watch characters that try to like toe that line like I, I feel like the theme of like the odyssey this part of it at least with odysseus so that i feel like this whole thing with poseidon blew up the way that it did because he wasn't trying to be like altruistic or nice for why he did that to polythemus because if he was, he wouldn't have blinded him because he wanted to steal all of his food. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't actually have to do that to him. Yeah. He could have just talked to him and been like, can we make a deal so that I can have some of your food? And my, cause my men and I are stranded here. We don't have anything. Could we do something so that you will give us the food we need to survive? And that could have actually worked in some way. You never know if it wouldn't, would have, because he never tried. But it's well, at least- He did try. He, he offered the wine and was like, here to make up for the, the sheep we already slaughtered and, yeah. and stuff. But yeah, 
I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Because this Polyphemus, at least in this version, doesn't seem... I mean, the, the Odyssey version almost seems a little bit more reasonable than this version. Because they even, like, animate it to be more monstrous. Yeah. I, yeah. It always reminds me of, um, like, Percy Jackson stuff. Because Percy is, like, that person in every book ever for the rest of his life. He's always trying to talk to the monsters even that are trying to kill him and he's always trying to negotiate with them to mm -hmm. make a deal because he doesn't actually want to hurt them and sometimes that does work in ways that people don't expect it to sometimes it doesn't but sometimes it does work and either way he has this like sort of reputation in that world for being somebody like that and so people are more willing to listen to him and give him benefit of the doubt because he's consistent with how he is like that like he wouldn't and especially i'm just thinking of the what happens with polyphemus and him in sea of monsters that he doesn't want to hurt him he like <laughs> feels really bad about hurting him because he knows that he's alone on this island and, and that's and his brother was, yeah and he and he was horribly hurt by odysseus long ago and that and he even says in that book like it wasn't right how odysseus did that to him Mm -hmm. And so he understands why Polythemus hates humans and doesn't trust them. He has every reason not to trust them, considering that experience happened to him. And so even though he knows he has to do something to him to stop him so that he doesn't hurt him and his friends, he like doesn't want to. He just and he understands why he's so upset at him and he empathizes with him mm -hmm. for why he hates him. He doesn't just like you know, be like, oh, you're just a monster. I don't care about what's going to happen to you. Or just assume the worst, I guess, about him mm -hmm. in the way that, like, Odysseus kind of does. Like, he doesn't even, he's just, right away, he's just like, we're just going to kill all of his sheep. And that's that on that. And doesn't, like, think about another option and mm -hmm. or see another way to get around it. And it's, I think it's funny in a way of, like the whole song with him and Athena, that him and Athena are both talking about how like cunning and smart he is. But when it comes to that, he couldn't think of anything else to try, but to do the thing that would like instigate things the absolute most with the monster on this island. Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's so many other things that you could have tried besides that one route, but you didn't even try. And mm -hmm. I think that's why Rick Riordan wrote him like that, um, or wrote like Polythemus and their interactions with him that way, because he wanted to give him at least me them many chances of trying different things. And even the way that it ends with him in Percy Jackson, at least, like Percy is having dreams about, like thinking about how he wants Polythemus to believe that he killed them. And he's okay with him believing that he took them out even though he didn't because he wants him to feel like he got a win out of something yeah like he has empathy for him enough where he like is okay with him believing that like believing that he actually won a fight when he didn't and mm -hmm. i'm just remembering all these different characters that have such big egos that would never be okay with somebody believing that they won when they actually lost and yeah. would feel like they need to like correct them about that <laughs> um but it, like it's it's a very like empathetic way of looking at him and and even like all of the like villains in percy jackson they he like somewhat can empathize with why they are doing those things like or why like certain like he can figure out the motivations of where like their motivations started off from even if he's obviously not okay at all with what they're doing, he can understand where it started from at a certain point and like recognizes that when he's like fighting them. Yeah. <laughs> like that kind of stuff makes him more interesting because he never does. It's like the irony of characters like that is that they never do what the villains expect them to. And so they usually succeed because they just think about things differently yeah with percy i have to wonder if it comes from the fact that he's always been kind of put into you're the bad kid role in the, mor the mortal world and so he's like okay everybody automatically thinks i'm bad what if that's not true for all these monsters yeah i feel like that like when i when i see people anywhere like 
characters or real people who I know have gone through difficult things that are similar to things I've gone through, even if they do things that are like seen as like bad or whatever, Mm -hmm. like I'm not as hard on them as sometimes other people are because I'm like, I, I felt like that one day I was a huge mess for Mm -hmm. most of my life and I'm not anymore. And so I'm like, if I could figure it out, anyone can figure it out because like the amount of stuff I had to figure out was like ridiculous. And so like, if I could do this, then anyone can do this. And so I try to give anyone like characters or real people, a lot of chances to figure it out because I feel like you have to like make a lot of mistakes and do a lot of things that maybe you shouldn't do in order to get to that place. And if people just immediately are like, no, you're done, goodbye, <laughs> then um, then you're then those people are never going to get there. Yeah, so I feel like that's where a lot of why I like the hero roles generally and people like Percy is that he does give people seven million billion um, chances and like he is not the one that is really like corporal punishment or like punitive in any way when it comes to the other characters even characters that have really hurt him or done things that could hurt him he's usually the one that is like trying to like defend them or trying to work with them even if he's upset at them at the same time and it's the whole like there's something that somebody does in the last book that hurts uh somebody really important to him and he still empathizes with that character and he's sad when that character is killed mm-hmm. and remembers him after that and remembers him when he's talking to the gods to like fix things so people like him don't have to go through that stuff and like that character tries to kill him and tries to kill people that are really important to him like doesn't show that he's questioning what he believes but that's how he talks to him like that that character is actually a a person like that for Percy, where there's a time where he could have taken him out and he didn't. Mm-hmm. And like people could say maybe that was the wrong choice, but it's like he's never going to be the one to take somebody like that out. He's going to be the one that believes that somebody like that could has like uh, there's something in them that has like a chance to turn around. Mm-hmm. That's why like Luke is kind of a special case because he can see that there is nothing there for him where he could possibly there's like nothing there that gives him any indication that he could like change his mind so he doesn't believe that he ever will and he's right about that um but if there's just like the tiniest thing that shows you that there's something in there that could be like salvaged then i think that it's worth it to try um and I, and I have to think that because I wouldn't still be alive anymore if I didn't think that <laughs> because there was like, that was me like six years ago. I didn't think there was any point um, to my life anymore. And I don't feel like that anymore, obviously, but for a long time I did. And I had to believe that there was something good that was supposed to come out of all of this in order to still be there. And I feel like that's, the kind of heroes like Percy and even the other people that are friends with him, like Annabeth and Grover and people in this world, even the other kids at camp, like there's, you know, stuff that happens with like Selena is really hard. And there's people that try to defend what she went through with Luke when they find out what, like what fully what happened and, and things like that. Um, and it's just that's you want people to to like have that sort of influence i guess like percy has an influence where he makes people look at even monsters because his brother is considered a monster in a more empathetic way and it's it's better for everybody involved to look at people that way and i feel like odysseus in this in these stories in these chapters or these songs are like the other way that if you try to like just shut everybody down then you can have the other reaction where nobody trusts you and you have to be on alert all the time because 
everyone is waiting for you to betray them. And like that is very similar to how like the stereotypical villains are in the story. Like Luke can't trust anybody. Mm-hmm. Everyone who's on his side are monsters who he despises and he thinks that he's better than. Or like demigods that he has like manipulated to being on his side, but they're also it's always possible that they'll realize that they don't want to do it anymore and they'll leave. Mm-hmm. And some of them do by yeah. the time they get to the last book. And so everything with him is so like there's no like like solid ground for him to ever stand on. He can never trust anyone who's around him. He can never be sure that anyone is actually on his side. He can never like confide in anybody like that because he's created an environment where he can't Mm -hmm. and that's just that's never going to like last long term no matter what you do yeah i mean we don't see it as much with this version of odysseus as we do in the odyssey but his intellect is what he like thinks puts him above other people and especially that that favor that he has with athena and with some of the gods, obviously not Poseidon. Um, he he does kind of have a superiority complex where it almost isn't that big of a deal in the way that the Odyssey is written that almost everybody doesn't make, or well, actually everybody doesn't make it. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird though, because I, I do want to separate like this version from that version. And this one is a lot more soft and emotional. We get that emotional backing from a lot of these decisions, but um, yeah, I don't know. And it's, it's also interesting to have Poseidon be like this to like close out the song. We have Poseidon saying the world is dark and ruthlessness is mercy upon ourselves um, before he says, die and takes out all of the ships um which most of the ships actually get destroyed by the lystragonians um i believe it was like 11 out of 12 ships which i feel like is kind of what was happening at the end of this song because he's left with only 43 men and odysseus uses that last little bit of the winds that in this version he was able to contain to escape but like i don't know yeah i don't know where i was going with that but well, what I what I was going to say is I kind of one of the things that happens with people that are smart is like what Odysseus does, where you feel like because you're intelligent or you know how to strategize that you can like out logic every situation that you're ever in, but you can <laughs> never out logic emotions ever. <laughs> and like the way that they do that with like in Percy Jackson world is Annabeth and Percy. Mm-hmm. Like Annabeth learns very quickly over and over and over and over again <laughs> that she, no matter what she does, like no matter how smart she is, she can't like overcome these like emotions that she feels towards Percy or anyone else in this world. And Percy constantly reminds her that if she lets herself feel things, that she will be like rewarded for that because he's you know, has his heart on his sleeve all the time. And Mm -hmm. they get out of situations that they usually wouldn't because he's just being honest with people about how he really feels instead of doing what he's supposed to. And the way that that, I feel like that's happened in these songs is like Odysseus is just like, oh, I'm smart and cunning. And so no matter the situation we come up against, I'll somehow find a way out of it. And then Poseidon shows up and is like, you hurt my son. Mm -hmm. you hurt my son like I don't care about strategy I don't care that apparently none of your men died during like the Troy war I don't care I don't care about you I don't care about your wife I don't care about your kids I don't care about anything you hurt my kid and so I'm going to destroy you now and there is nothing that you can say to me you can't use logic at me because you hurt my kid Like, there is nothing that you can say to me that will fix this situation because you already did the thing that I'm really upset at you about and you can't fix it. And it's like him being like shoved in this situation of like, you can't out logic somebody who is that upset 
with you because you hurt somebody that they care about. You yeah. can't, you can't fix it. It doesn't matter how many different things you try to do to get around it. You're never going to get around it because their emotions supersede all of the logic that you think you have. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If the person, the other person is passionate about something, that's going to overwhelm you because they will not stop like ever. And it's, that's like the thing with, with them is like, he just thinks that I will always be able to like talk myself out of the situation. And it's, and Poseidon's just there to remind him like, no, you won't. Like, and it's for a very like, like almost like primitive reason. Like you hurt my child. I don't care about anything else about you. I don't care that like my sister was doing whatever with you. It doesn't, none of that matters because you hurt my kid and now you have to pay. And yeah, the interesting thing about Poseidon's stance here though, is it almost seems like he's saying, I would have respected you more had you taken him out fully. Yeah, um, to, for Poseidon's side, for if you're like the loved one of somebody, like mm-hmm. imagine that your loved one is blind and has no food and is just like left there suffering. Mm-hmm. It's like worse to imagine that their their suffering is continuing instead of it ending. Like like when my uncle died about a year ago, it took like five days for him to finally die when he was in the hospital. Mm-hmm. And I remember that the one day that I was there, I like kept wanting to leave because I just was so upset about thinking that he was going to, and I just wanted it to happen because he was in so much pain because he was dying from cancer. He was in so much pain that I just wanted the pain to stop because it was like unbearable watching him in that, be in that much pain. And it's the same sort of, that's like how Poseidon feels about how he left Polythemus is like, I feel like at least if you killed him, his suffering would be done. Like, I think that Poseidon still would have done all of this to him regardless, but I think it would have been, it's harder for him to know that his kid is out there suffering still and that there's nothing that he can, that he can do to like fix it. And that he like, you know, when things happen with William, the thing that's the hardest for you is when it's not a situation that you can just fix. Yeah. Uh, Your son is just struggling with something and that, and that you can't just make him feel better because it's just like something that they just have to struggle with because that's just how life can be sometimes and so for it is a situation like that like i would rather you just take me out than to like make me be in this much pain and continue on like that because at least then the pain would be over like Mm -hmm. that's that's honestly what most suicidal people feel like we just or like we don't actually want to die, but at least if we die, I won't feel like this anymore. Um, and that, but it's that sort of an idea, and that feels like an offense to for Poseidon of like not only did you hurt my child, but you also left them in this situation that can't they're they're just blind now, mm-hmm. and they don't have any of their food. They spent all this time like with those like building up all of that stuff, and you just took that from them. And they have to continue trying to live without being able to see or like get anything that they need anymore. And I have to watch them as like their dad, watch them struggle like that, knowing that there's nothing that I can do to make it better. But I can at least make you feel bad. (laughs) That's why I love watching this part. So I'm like, yeah, I identify with this a lot. I definitely like um, if you're if you're mean enough to me on the internet, there's a certain point. Or if you're mean to people that I really care about, there's a certain like switch that flips that I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be a giant bitch to you right now, and I'm not gonna feel bad that I'm doing it because you deserve it. Yeah, and it's it's literally something like that. Like if you push me too far, then you're gonna like I'm gonna unleash everything on you and not feel bad because you've done something bad enough that I don't care. Like on my on this day thing, this video that I, a couple different videos I made in like 2021 came up and I remember this happening back then. And it was one of the times when somebody was trying to tell you that emotional incest isn't real. And it was like three videos of me telling them to shut the fuck up. (laughs) 
And I was like saying it in like a nice way. Like at first, like I was telling, I remember the interactions with this person and mm -hmm. it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice like interaction. Um, but I was trying to be nice to them at first and saying like, it doesn't make sense to like play these games of like saying which abuse is worse. Like it's all bad mm -hmm. and things like that. And it was also like, leave my friend alone. What is wrong with you? And it, then, but it was like funny watching me do that because <laughs> we do the same thing now. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's like that, it's like that sort of an idea of like, I can watch people say really horrible things, but if you're mean to somebody that I care about, then I would get like, it's not even like irrationally angry. It's just rationally angry. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. like and like protective and be like no like some like one of the things i think is like fun and i'm like glad that i have this role is some of the people that i talk to about percy jackson stuff they'll send me videos when some of the videos that i respond to are ones that people send to me because mm -hmm. they see them and they're like upset about what the person has said like usually ones involving like luke and they'll send them to me because they want me to respond to them because they're like i know that you can say this in a more like eloquent way than i can mm -hmm. and i always do like every time they send me a video like that i always respond and i'm like i'm glad that i have this sort of that i can do this that i can have this sort of role that people trust that i can like say what needs to be said when people are saying things that like really hurt their feelings because of course all the people that send me those things are people that have gone through some sort of abuse in their life mm -hmm. and that they've told me about in some way and so that's why they're sending it to me because it makes them upset reminding rem remembering what they went through and it feels like the best thing ever <laughs> that i could finally be in a position where i could be like a little like speaking head for people like that and i can take it and can handle it when in the past i definitely couldn't and they and just the idea that they don't have to deal with that because mm -hmm. i can just do it for them like that's so much fun <laughs> and so i'm glad that i have that role now but it's it's it just reminds me of this stuff of like it's a very just like human sort of thing of with poseidon which mm -hmm. is why i think i always liked him is because because of the whole God, what is that one line they say in the Percy Jackson books? Um, the sea does not like to be restrained. That's what he yeah. says. And so it's a very similar line to that where he is like this all powerful God, but he also sometimes gets really emotional about hurting people that he cares about and will like fuck you up. <laughs> and like the other gods will get emotional when they when they personally are hurt. Mm -hmm. like zeus will like zeus like tries to like lightning out like six-year-old percy's kite out of the sky mm -hmm. because he's so mad that his brother has a child that could possibly like challenge his rule one day mm -hmm. but like poseidon gets upset because he feels protective of his kids and mm -hmm. things like that but that's like a different sort of anger and rage because it's connected to just like primal emotions yeah that which like makes it he's always been the most interesting god to me in that with like the odyssey because that's where all of that stuff in the odyssey comes from mm -hmm. it's just like you hurt somebody that i love and now i will make you suffer for it for the rest of your life <laughs> and it's not like athena being like you need to turn off all of your emotions and just become a logical robot like me or any or anyone else like that it's like a very like human thing that anyone can really connect to mm -hmm. and i honestly think that's why rick riordan picked him as like the dad for his main character is because that's just such an interesting sort of archetype to expand on yeah um when the other gods it's a lot harder to expand on them in the same way because there isn't as much there yeah i think connecting him back to water signs is also just like really <laughs> a good metaphor too i that makes me think of katara because like you have the one side of her where she's mother you know she like mothers the whole gang 
But then you have the other side where she's like literally one of the most bad. I mean, all of them are badass, right? But Katara is the only one that can take on Azula out of all of them. Yeah, and one of my favorite things about Katara that is one of the things that sometimes people get mad at her about, but I don't care, is that she doesn't trust Zuko. Like, mm-hmm. she is the absolute last one. She never really fully trusts him for the longest time. And, yeah. like, if I was in a situation like that, I would never trust that person. Mm-hmm. Ever. It would take them, like, seven years to probably <laughs> to get me to actually trust them completely. And so I totally understand when I, every time I watch Atla, I totally get it. Why? Even though everyone else is like, but just forgive Zuko. He's a good person. He really, and she's like, I don't care because yeah. she's, she has to be the one to protect everybody. Cause that's just her role. And it's like, one of the things about like the ocean is I, I love the ocean. Um, my sister was just texting me about there being like a new documentary on Netflix about the ocean and she's like we need to watch this maybe we can watch this on thanksgiving if football is boring or something she knows that i love i love the ocean and um the thing that i always find like why i love the ocean because i know some people are terrified of it Mm -hmm. and things like that and i'm like that's why i love it because it's gigantic it's terrifying and also beautiful and it's kind of beautiful when it's being terrifying. Like the, I love watching videos of like gigantic waves during like hurricanes and things like that. Those like crazy videos that trend on here every couple months of people in like the North Sea. I watch them over and over and over again because I just think it's so cool to see like how big of waves like the ocean can make and how we have no control. There's like when like when there's a what is it called a type not a typhoon the other word uh tsunami when like a tsunami happens and they make waves that are 50 feet tall like i remember watching once a video about the tsunami that happened in 2011 in japan Mm -hmm. and there was this this one video i found somewhere where the person was like close enough to like land but also far enough away where you could see like how big the waves are. And there was like a little car at like the very bottom of the screen and the waves were like up here. Oh, and it just showed that like the waves were literally like 40 feet tall when they were like reaching land. And like, that's why everything got destroyed. And I was like, I've never seen something that shows like the actual, like, like shows how big those waves actually are. And I know it doesn't make any sense to watch things like that because they're terrifying. But that's like why I like to watch it because it's almost like beautiful to watch something that terrifying because you can't stop it mm-hmm. and you just kind of have to deal with whatever it decides to do is what it's going to do to you. Yeah, I think that's what's amazing about it is that we don't understand the ocean that we don't know what's in the ocean that we can never ever know what's in the ocean because there's so much of it that we can never reach. Mm-hmm. And like that mystery about it, it makes it so interesting to me. And it, the like to add like emotion onto it when you make a character that's like the manifestation of the ocean is like it's the same sort of thing. Like you don't, you almost like people almost like don't understand like the depths of their emotions or like their connections to other people until those connections are challenged, and then they learn real fucking quick. <laughs> like how how they actually feel and they're usually like surprised by it but that's like kind of the fun of people like that like in Percy Jackson people get like surprised by him consistently about how connected he feels towards certain people and that he makes different decisions because of those connections he has with people and they like don't get it because it would be easier for him not to feel that way but he's like but then why would I exist as a person? And yeah. that's basically how how he looks at it. And it's worth it for him um, to do that stuff. But it's like people are always surprised at a certain point with how much he actually cares about the other people around him. Like they like like the whole storyline with Zoe in Titan's Curse. She's like waiting for him to be like every other hero she's ever interacted with. And she's pleasantly surprised when he's not. Mm-hmm. 
And so it's that kind of a thing of she's waiting for him to be like everybody else. And then she at some point realizes like, oh, he's actually like this nice of a person all the time. Yep. This this like isn't an act he's never going to like give in to what everybody else does and put himself first. He's never going to he's literally like holding up the sky right now and slowly dying. <laughs> like he's never going to put himself first if it means that other people are gonna be in pain over him. And mm -hmm. it, it it like reminds me of how they present Poseidon in the Odysseys too, of like, did you you didn't think about what you were doing before you did this. <laughs> like out of all of the gods in the world to make angry, I'm not sure that the one in charge of the ocean that has like a lot of emotions and can like let them out on you sometimes was like the best mm -hmm. move that you could have done. Because like at least like if you made Zeus mad, just don't go in the sky. <laughs> but like you're by water all the time. How are you going to get away from Poseidon if he wants to hurt you when any, you have to be by water to get anywhere? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that covers the songs we, we listened to for today, the animations we watched. Um, just like another note on the animations really quick was like, was it just me or did did they potentially switch animators for that last song that we watched, like for <laughs> Ruthlessness? Because Odysseus changed in look. Yeah, there's usually, I know that they use a bunch of, a couple of different people. Yeah. And sometimes they're used on their, on the videos, their usernames will sometimes be on there. And sometimes they're not, but I know that they use multiple people for each, like, saga. And so it's kind of fun to see, like, the, the, like, bare bones, I guess, like, art style that okay. they all use. But each artist gets to interpret it a little bit differently to make it their own thing. Yeah. Um, that's just more fun that way. Of course, and being like, don't fuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> I love the animation of the horses, like literally ramming into the ships and stuff, too. Very emblematic of like horses being his animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, okay, that's everything we planned for. I gotta get William to bed once again, but, um, hopefully we'll have something new to talk about next. Oh, wait, there's one more thing we didn't cover, and William's on break, so I, I can say a little, I always do this. Um, but really quick, because it's about to be Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we wanted to touch on, like, just a little pep talk for everybody, because, um, especially our, our younger viewers, like you might be forced into hanging out with, with people that have very big political opinions after everything that's gone down with the election. It might be very stressful this year. It usually is on an election year. We've been alive long enough that we've seen this a few times where it's like, oh, everybody's arguing around the dinner table and I don't like this. <laughs> Yeah, and so we we just wanted to like let you know it, it might happen. Everything's going to be okay. You can come online and vent later. Um, it's not worth it to get involved is, is what my advice would be because, you know, like just let other people hash it out and watch and listen and take note, but you don't have to get involved if it's going to be super emotional for you. Yeah, the way that I, I guess, dealt with being around my dad's family when we did see them is I just like, I just like shut down. And like that maybe isn't like the best thing in the long term, but who cares? Like, this is just in the moment. And I would just like, just shut down and like not really feel anything around them. And it would make me be numb. But it was a way of like, I didn't have to like, the things that were happening around me would feel farther away. And so it would be easier for me to deal with being there because my dad would always end up yelling at everybody. And like, we would end up storming out every single time, like literally every single time. And so every time we went, it was just a matter of like, how long were we going to be there until we would have to leave? Mm -hmm. So 
I know that sort of feeling of like waiting for things to go wrong. And so the best way I knew how to do that was just try to like shut off my emotions, try to like think about something in my head that made me happy and just try to not like really listen too much about what people are saying or, or get involved in anything because things would have been a lot worse for me later on if I did. Mm-hmm. And in that same vein, the thing I wanted to like, just say for kids, especially kids, if you're queer and like your family doesn't know, or certain people in your family don't know, the Mm -hmm. internet sometimes talks about that stuff like queerness and being open about your queerness in a way that isn't actually applicable to like real people or especially people in like family situations that aren't the best. And so the thing I saw somebody say today that I knew I wanted to repeat is like, just if you need to stay in like the proverbial closet in order for you to be safe, do that. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong. You're not like being less of a queer person or, or anything like that, that sometimes people say online, if you do that, because you will still be okay. Mm-hmm. And like, when it comes to situations like this, if you have to be around family that isn't accepting of you, you don't have to be a martyr and like make yourself think that you have to tell them about whatever identity you have that fits under the queer umbrella. You don't have to ever say anything to them, like ever. Like yeah. most of the family that I have has no idea that I am gender fluid and asexual. I didn't even tell my mom or my sister about that until I didn't care what they thought of me anymore because I was talking about everything else that happened to me. Mm -hmm. And that was like five years ago that I told them that. (laughs) And that was, and I'm 39, I'm old. Most of my family doesn't know that at all. And I have no reason to tell them because they don't, they don't need to know. And like, if I told them, they probably wouldn't understand. And so I don't need to put myself through that in order to prove something to me. And I guess that's the thing I wanted to put out there is that like if just not talking about that stuff makes your life easier then just do that because Mm -hmm. all that really matters especially right now with like trump around is surviving like that's like the main thing of just figuring out a way to get through this time and then hoping that after he hopefully goes away one day (laughs) we'll be able to try to like fix everything but the main thing is just you being able to like survive this situation that you're in Mm -hmm. and so if that means that you don't that you don't tell your parents or your siblings or people outside of like your friends that you feel like you can trust or something about this it doesn't mean that you're like ashamed of who you are or anything like that it just means that you're trying to protect yourself yeah and considering how much like anti-queer legislation he's i already saw today that he wants to make it where trans people can't be in the military again which is something that he did the last time he was president. And so he's already talking about doing that like the first day that he's president. And that's just the stuff that he's saying. There's other things that he's not gonna say that he's gonna try to do that is worse. And so with that kind of stuff happening, it's just fine to not tell anybody any of this stuff about yourself because as much as people make like coming out like this big thing you're supposed to do you don't actually have to do that mm-hmm. like if you don't want to and you don't and it wouldn't make you feel it would if it puts you in a bad situation you don't have to actually do anything like that if you don't want to mm-hmm. and it's and it's perfectly fine especially around like the holidays when you're like stuck at somebody's house and you can't leave yeah <laughs> just act like you're a boring ass straight person and talk about football yeah Yeah, find something, you know, there's always a semblance of something, even with horrible families, hang out with the little kids, maybe hang out with the dog, you know, like, you know, Mm -hmm. if you're being forced to be around family that makes you uncomfortable and doesn't feel safe, do what you have to do, (laughs) like, just do what you have to do. And like, long term, if you are stuck in a home situation where it's not safe to be out, or it's not is not safe to fully express yourself. Like you have to live, you have to survive. It's really hard times right now of affording a place by yourself as a young adult is practically impossible. So 
like it's okay to wait until you're fully out of your parents' house and stuff to come out to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you, you have to protect yourself in situations like that, and mm -hmm. just keep everything you can to yourself until you're in a place where you can be safe. And you can tell whoever you would want to at that point anything about yourself. I did want to add on that my mom reminded me of this thing that exists that is called like a safe place where it's a registered safe place. She reminded me because the church in my hometown is one, which is a very unsafe place generally for queer people. But there are places that are like registered safe places where any queer, especially kids, that show up there and need a place to stay or just like want to be somewhere where they can be open about who they are and not worry about anyone hurting them. Like at meet, like they have like weekly meetings and things like that. Those places are always an option too, just to, even if you just want to find out where they are, a lot of them that I've seen so far are at like churches, which sounds weird, but the kind of church it's at is the Unitarian Church. Mm -hmm. Is if I was if I was somebody who was looking for a place like that, even in the most conservative areas, I would Google Unitarian churches because they're hardly a church. They're more like a, just a social justice like networking agency <laughs> than yeah. anything else. Like they have like a whole part of when you go to that church is that um, you they have like a whole thing of about sex ed that they teach all of their kids as part of like going to the church there um like my mom's partner goes to that church and so they do things and so like last weekend they went to like the black holocaust museum in the city that i live in as part of like a church outing okay. and so that sort of a church is very social justice forward they're very accepting of queer people and so if there was like a kind of safe place like that if you did need somewhere to go for like the night because you just couldn't handle it anymore a place like that would would be something that would be available to you no matter what and so if it is if it does get really bad that is like an option for you to look into too i'll, I'll try to post like links of the places that i found so far it's it's one of those hard things where there are some lists of those places but people also don't want there to be that many lists of those places because they don't want the people that would target them to find them all yeah so some of it is just like word of mouth um but i guess i would say if you can't if you if the website that i'm gonna link doesn't have like anything around where you live um try to find like a lgbtqia like nonprofit, like community center in your area even if it's kind of far from where you live if you live out in the country and just ask them if they know places near you where you could go because they probably know of something. Yeah. A lot of us know each other in that way or like will help, especially if it's like kids or young people. Um, they'll do that. Like there's, I don't know if this is, there, it has to be a thing where you live in like Northern California, but at least where, where I live, there's a nonprofit here that the entire existence of its nonprofit is that it has dorms for queer people who get kicked out of their house so they have somewhere to live and that's like what they use all of their money for they have a building like downtown where i live and that's like what they do there they just have like apartment basically where people who get kicked out of their homes can live if they don't have anywhere else to go so they don't end up homeless like a lot of people can end up homeless and then you know get caught up in in things that they shouldn't or die yeah and, there are a lot of organizations like that we you might just not know where they are but they're out there somewhere yeah yeah definitely look up those i don't know if there's one with dorms in in the area but i do know there's a nonprofit, and i saw that they're doing a thanksgiving event for people that don't have family that's accepting that they can be around so there's even some things like that yeah they all, all of those sort of organizations always do events like that a lot of um restaurants that are not American will do like Thanksgiving events like that too. A lot of domestic violence shelters have things like that going on where anyone can come mm -hmm. and and get whatever food they need. And so there's a lot of options like that if you just 
like can't take your stupid family and want to like go somewhere else for the day that is also an option <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> and, sometimes and, that is the option <laughs> yeah and if you are a full-on adult friendsgiving is something that people do you know like if you have friends in the area and your families are intolerable like just plan a friendsgiving and say you can't make it because of work or something you know yeah you don't have to actually tell them the truth. Yeah. You be like, I can't go. Goodbye. And mm -hmm. that's the end of that. Yeah. Um, so I, I do have to get William, I'll get William to bed now. But like, um, yeah, for next week, we'll watch a little bit more of Epic. And if any other fan news comes out about the series coming up, we'll, we'll cover that, of course, too. Mm -hmm. Hopefully the teenagers calm down now. And we can just go back to talking to her alone. <laughs> She's just a Leo. She's just getting attention for the wrong reason at the moment. She's also an Aries moon. And I was oh, like, yeah, yeah, this is the kind of shit that happens to us. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Happy Thanksgiving to anybody who's celebrating. And we're here if you need to talk about your bad families in our comment section. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, um, we'll see you guys next week. Bye.